person at ICMI in, in Montreal. Um, yeah, today I will talk about multimodal AI specifically on a subset of this challenge of building AI uh, with multiple modality, uh, which is the challenge of generating nonverbal behaviors uh, for virtual human or for other application, it could be movies or robots, uh, like the great talk we had a little bit uh, earlier. Um, we are in a world where AI and multimodal be, uh, technologies are really becoming more and more present in our world. In fact, uh, we all spend the last uh, year and a half on one of these technology uh, video conferencing. And it really brings a, a nice paradigm for multimodal AI, also emphasizes the need of new technology to an understand uh, human uh, communicative behaviors, what are the best way, what is the best way to do a hybrid conference, definitely still an open question. Uh, when we do these, uh, when we are communicating uh, either through uh, video conferencing or with face to face, there are a lot of information that is shared through uh, both verbal and nonverbal. I sometimes hinted as a 3B of communication, verbal, vocal and visual. Verbal is, are the words you say, uh, but also the way you phrase your sentence and the intent you have behind these sentence. Um, on the vocal, there is the prosody when you are speaking words, but there's also all those vocal expression that happen when words are not expressed, but other expression like laughter or pause fillers. And me, my background being originally from computer vision, I also very interested in uh, visual behaviors, uh, the gestures, the eye gestures, in fact, body language, proxemics is one of these cues that very uh, challenging uh, either to express or to perceive uh, through these uh, 2D interfaces. Eye contact is often one of the main cue or first cue I look at when I look at communication and definitely facial expressions as well. So the goal of uh, multimodal AI uh, is, is very big and a subset of that is multimodal perception uh, where you would want to integrate information from vocal, visual and verbal to infer something about these uh, communicative behavior, maybe from mental health, like depression or distress or uh, social behavior or social signals like leadership or empathy and also also interested in all of these emotional signal uh, and we saw some of these in the previous talks uh, to address this challenge uh, you always ask yourself this is such a big challenge what are the the sub challenges of this and that has been a topic of interest for me for many years and we started in 2015, this idea of trying to understand those core challenges and, and build a, an initial draft of this uh, taxonomy uh, in this uh, survey paper. We're looking at representation, alignment, translation, fusion, and co-learning. Uh, if you are interested in this topic as much as me, uh, nicely because of the pandemic, the whole course of multimodal machine learning, more than 20 hours of lectures, uh, is all available on YouTube and you can look at it uh, online. But yeah, the one core first challenge is the challenge of representation. How do we either fuse, coordinate, or even fission like this information, factorize this information? And then if you ask me one of the core challenge in multimodal is the alignment. And when you have elements of one modality, how do they synchronize with other modality? And when it comes down to after that, getting closer to uh, a full task, then the translation or fusion can happen. Translation going from one modality to another or fusion where you integrate the information. And there's also core learning when one modality helps another. So today I will focus the talk primarily on translation because I want to translate from speech and learn this grounding, this like alignment between my speech and my gesture. And so implicitly you will study also representation and alignment. Hi, I'm Al. 
And as an example from that uh, is this uh, great project I had the pleasure to be part of at USC uh, Sim Sensei. As an example, it's a little bit old, but still interesting, where you learn, uh, you can see example of animation, automatic animation. In fact, a lot of the animation there are done with one of the uh, participants of the workshop, uh, Stacy Marcella's work um, and at that point the most of the work I've done was on the sensing of the human part but it's a great example and if you have a chance uh, please look at the ICCB uh, workshop last week where Stacy gave a wonderful talk explaining how these behavior uh, came up uh, and how the virtual human was animated. I think it's a great example. Hi I'm Ellie. Thanks for coming in today. I was created to talk to people in a safe and secure environment. I'm not a therapist, but I'm here to learn about people and would love to learn about you. I'll ask a few questions to get us started. And please feel free to tell me anything. Your answers are totally confidential. Are you okay with this? Yes. So, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. That's good. Where are you from originally? I'm from Los Angeles. Oh, I'm from LA myself. Okay, this was an example that I love, um, the, but there's so much work that happened behind the scene in building this virtual human. So then you have to ask yourself, uh, can we do learn a lot of these behavior automatic from data? Let's say you have this recording of LP giving talk. Can I, uh, uh, next time, just... Um, I don't know, go to a restaurant and just have my virtual human just give the talk for me. Never that I want to do that. Uh, but can you learn from example how a person behaves? Can we look at their can we look at their vocal and verbal to infer visual? And it's been a long line of research in this. We ourselves started this as early as in uh, 2000, and in fact, 2005 was the known one. One of the work was also with Stacy at uh, bringing early on both. Uh, graphical models and neural networks was an example in that direction. What I will talk about today is they like these more recent approaches that that uh, take advantage of those deep neural representation to study representation learning alignment and the translation. All of these challenges all together, and the key aspect here is I want to be a little bit closer to real world scenarios, uh, not just in the lab, but real world data and be able to learn from this where, where in the real world, you have a lot of variability. A lot of people are gesturing very differently and you all may also have some of a missing data. And so you want to be able to handle the situation. And so this is why it is towards real world. And a lot of the work I will present today uh, was led uh, by Shatanya Aruja, who is in fact in the, uh, will is, is in fact in the job market. It just uh, will be uh, defending his PhD really soon. And you already heard from Don who, who collaborated very actively on this project. And I should mention that Don will uh, be applying for PhD. Uh, so if you're lucky, you will be working with him if he doesn't stay in CMU. Um, so um, uh, Pat's data set is a, a nice uh, um, uh, resource that uh, was very, uh, that is created by our lab that is uh, freely available. And it is our attempt and we're, we're, we're all in fact building that to be even bigger, uh, looking at uh, Paul's audio and transcript. And also we're really interested in style. How is the style uh, uh, of a person so that we can eventually maybe transfer style of a speaker from uh, one person to another. So if you're interested in that topic of uh, gesture generation, this is one data set and there's a few more that we heard about um, before. But I wanna talk about three main challenges uh, in this kind of uh, problem of learning gestures. And the first one, the core one, the main main one is really about grounding. A grounding meaning linking my gesture to my speech, my language. Um, and, but the speech, I have more than words. There's also the vocal aspect of those uh, words. And so as a small but important still, and you're going to see how important when I show the result, is to align locally 
words with acoustic behaviors and 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 you could say oh this is the simple word alignment when i say a word uh but that will mean that there's no contextualization there's no in fact long-range dependency that that my emphasis is only related to that exact word that i emphasize but sometimes the emphasis is really an impact on the whole sentence and so how do you contextualize by aligning but in a more soft way this alignment between the language. And so that's a first challenge, an initial challenge I will talk about right now. And then I'll share a few more of these technical challenges. But the first one is like, how do you align words? And yes, you could force each uh, with a typical word alignment. But what we will want here is look at it almost because often the uh, a better way to think of language will be more at the phrase or sometimes verb phrase level or non phrase and so we want to think about it that not only it's a direct line alignment but a more contextualized and to do this and you have your uh, let's say as input uh, your audio frame it could be a representation of the prosthetic features um, at, over time and the words in some local embedding uh, uh, of them and then the goal that we will have is to contextualize. And so, yeah, as a way to move towards that, we'll look at attention blocks, uh, following the, uh, the naming convention that is became popular in the self-attention and transformer. So then the vocal will be my query, will be my kind of frame of reference. And the key will be there to say, this is my language and I want to align uh, this language to all of those vocal frames. And why we do it this way is that vocal frames are, are often more uh, fine grain and the verb are a little bit more coarse grain. And that's why we use the, this and not the opposite way. And doing this, then you can create uh, using a simple but efficient uh, attention block, you can uh, learn this small attention and this soft assignment. And what's great with this when you compare with a typical more naive uh, word alignment is that the same word can have impact on many uh, word uh, on many uh, audio uh, clips and the uh, same audio clip can be uh, applied to many words. And so it's a nice a mini to many kind of uh, relationship. And so by when you take that attention block and then do um, uh, uh, multiplication by the original language, uh, you get this aligning language representation. So it's just a language representation that is now with the same kind of um, uh, granularity as the audio and using that and uh, let's say just concatenating with the audio, then you can generate your pose. And as we've seen for some of the uh, recent work in the last two or three years, a lot of time these post generation can get improvement when you have also uh, not just the generator, but also a discriminator that is there to decide or to, 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 to emphasize, uh, is it a real or generated? And the goal, as we know now, but to these generative adversarial network is that the discriminator should not hopefully be able to discriminate. That's the goal. So the generator should do its best uh, to confuse uh, the discriminator. And so using that, you want now we have a lying audio and language. And so you will ask yourself, like, what is the next big step? And it's not just the number of companies, it's the variety. You've got fast cash, cash central, speedy. So a lot of the gestures, you want to be able to learn uh, gestures from data. Um, and one of the big challenge when you start, the second challenge I want to talk about is that when you learn from these gestures, like this is the gesture of one speaker, what happened is there is a subset of gestures uh, that happen very frequently. And probably you know this, the beat gestures are a great example in that direction. And so, yes, they are useful for communication. They show a lot of communication, but they are so repetitive that they may bias your model to only do a beat uh, the generator. And some of the more interesting one, like counting that he's doing, these may happen very few, 
but if done the right way at the right time can be extremely powerful. And so how do you learn from that long tail distribution that can be somewhat more relevant, but a lot more infrequent? And so the challenge, how do we model long tail distribution of generated gesture? And that is a second part of the, and so you have this distribution of data of gestures, and you can see that some of them happen very often, some of them happen less often. So the conventional uh, approach is when you're learning, you're learning maybe through some batches, you will simply uh, randomly sample from this. And, and by randomly sampling, you're gonna sample because of just the distribution, sample more often from the one that happened more often uh, and less often from the other ones. And so your loss, um, is just going to be the average over this sampling. So uh, uh, one approach that uh, that that sounds good, uh, but in practice is not as efficient as as we would like, would be to do a static resampling, where when in fact your uh, loss is just simply weighted uh, or inversely weighted by the, the the sampling weights. So 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 that you low you lower the the weight when uh, you when the, the the gestures happen often and for the one that don't happen often you increase the weights that are uh, and so so that sounds obvious but but it turned out in practice this is not what seems to work the best and that's why we have seen better other uh, ways of sorry sampling and one of them that is, although a little bit older uh, old is still really powerful is important sampling and the main novelty there is that you have a new term that tells you which region that needs more training, which region needs more training. And the idea is that while you do the optimization, you would like to update that uh, piece of information. So, but how to identify that sample that need more training? That becomes the question. And let's look again at our uh, model, the generative and adversarial, so the generator and the discriminator. And we can ask ourselves, what information could we uh, uh, get from this model? So the generator generate the post, discriminator is there to know is this generated one is something that uh, am I good at discriminating it and realizing that it's a generated and not a real from the ground truth sample? And so the intuition is let's take advantage of this discriminator. We already have it in the model, it's there. Let's take advantage of it. The, so samples that are identified as, as fake, as, as generated, then they probably need more training. That's the intuition. Samples that are fake probably need more training. And so I should increase the weight for them. So my probability will be related to that output to the discriminator. Is the discriminator is, is really, uh, really confident that it's a fake one. And, and it's one minus just because a typical output is, 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 is it a, a ground truth or not, but one minus that. And so is it a fake one? that will be uh, telling me, oh, okay, that is a sample that I probably just need to work more on. And, and the second nice, uh, although this one is more like a mathematical trick, but it turned out to be important too, is that we will divide this by the number, by the ratio from uh, thinking that it's a real one. It's just a, a trick that allows us to simplify the term because a lot of the, um, the uh, the details in that discriminator output will be nicely um, uh, uh, removed when you do the ratio of the fake versus the real. And that's what we talk, call um, the IL or the adversarial important sampling learning. And so advantage is now without, like we already had again, we already had a generative adversarial network. So, so we just look at the output of it and use that to decide for the next batch uh, how uh, how much weighting for all the samples. So no more additional parameters really. And the computation time is very minimal because it's really just about taking what's already in our model. So now when you take this 
um, and model and I can show is like during the training, yes, maybe at the beginning, you don't know where to look for. So you start with the typical, more conventional sampling. But as you go along, you're gonna increase and increase the samples that are the, the hardest for the system uh, to go on. And so in practice, now, if I look the, in the full system, so you have an, a local alignment of acoustic and, and the language, and then you use this uh, to generate, uh, that's the output from the generator, and then you also have our discriminator that check. And then the output of this discriminator allows us to wait. Uh, and that is what will be used for the next epoch to wait uh, all of the samples. And then we go again and again over the different epoch of the optimization. So the output for this, and this is the same graph I showed earlier with Oliver. And so in light blue, if you remember, that was the ground truth. In purple, what you see is the when you use both the local alignment of the audio and the language, and when you also model explicitly the long tail, then you suddenly are, when you look at the prediction of your gesture, this is one of the, um, uh, of the dimension of, um, uh, of, of, our, uh, of a gesture. So how do you quantify gestures is always a big, a uh, question. Here we use um, uh, one dimension, which is velocity. This is inspired by the work of Catherine Polasho. Look at five different dimensions when uh, quantifying or at least qualitatively described gestures. And, and, and we explored other one also as acceleration and other of them. So, uh, but also when you don't align locally, or contextualize it turn out to have an impact uh, on your work. Uh, and so this is, um, and definitely you need to also model the long tail distributions. So this is a nice example. Um, I just want to go now to a third challenge, which is, okay, now you heard LP talking. Can I have other people talk like LP or gesture like LP? I don't know if you want really that in the world of a bunch of mini LP, but the idea is to take and take a, because there's a lot of diversity in how people take gesture. Part in the study because they were busy having the time of their lives. It also doesn't change much of what they went into change. So what we will really want is now to have this multimodal gesture space so that uh, you have LP gestures or you have uh, uh, Oliver gestures. Um, so all of this, you would like to be able to learn that gesture space and be able to move around it so that if you have a speaker. And actually this here is S process, you could have guessed that. And I want to emphasize that the style here, uh, we're going to use a, a broader definition of the style. It's not just the person, but it's the person in a specific environment with a specific goal, a uh, communicative goal. So the style will want to transfer to a new speaker. And it's not just the number of companies, it's the variety. You've got fast cash, cash central, speedy. So here you have someone who had never lifted, at least in our data set, lifted their arm, but we were able to transfer the, the style of one from the other. So that's an example space that we want to learn. So what does this space represent? How do we use this um, gesture space to generalize style gesture? And how do we learn this gesture space? Uh, so the multiple gesture space will have a hopefully uh, will have hopefully uh, yeah is everybody hearing me? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Remind us of the time, I think. Right. Yeah, it is huh? like five, five minutes left. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so how do we stylize these gestures? Oh, you guys are really strict with time. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes. And so uh, our goal is for one speaker to be able to animate another speaker. So that as, as you suddenly have the speech of another person, and then you have this uh, nice 
um, gesture space. So uh, the learning of it will be uh, an extension of what we described earlier. So the idea is that if you you general you learn uh, from a new speaker or the audio to generate the gesture, we're going to look at this distribution of the gesture of that person, the generated person, and see how well or how close is it from the original uh, style of the, 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 the source style. So it's, it's looking at the distribution of the two uh, set of gestures. So that's what the loss will be that will allow us to learn that gesture spirit. But another important component is that gestures has many, uh, there's many ways of gesturing. And so we'll uh, extend the idea of GAN to have a mixed GAN where you have a mixture of, of generators. And that helps for two things. One is because you have multiple people and so you're learning from multiple people, but even the same person will have multiple type of gesture. And the most obvious one is like, sometimes I may decide to not gesture and sometimes I may decide to gesture and both are very valid options. And so if you have only one generator, it is gonna make it much harder. Having multiple hypotheses makes it easier. And so you're able to do that to Except be able to gesture. The one regret he has is that he didn't go to the Statue of Liberty because it would be nice to be able to say that at least once in his life, he spent some time <laughs> And they can transfer that to someone and, and, and then extend their gesture a lot more than what they originally had uh, in their original gesture. So I talk about gesture and challenges in multimodal AI, fusion and co-learning. I didn't focus as much, but these are core challenges. But one take home I wanted you to remember is that and now that we are pushing the envelope, we should also think those real world challenges. So I talk about variability, meaning that there's a lot of idiosyncrasy, a lot of different way of gesturing, but also robustness, because I want to be able to uh, handle a lot of missing data. Uh, you want to be able to study work with a lot of noise. Another aspect that's really important is trust. Uh, you wanna be able to build these system in a way that you know enough of how things are happening internally, maybe even sometime controlling some aspect of it so that it can be deployed in system and environment that require maybe interaction with human. Human, if they don't trust the technology would be very challenging. Another aspect very important is fairness. Uh, you want to be able to be aware of the biases of inside the system and hopefully remove as many of them. And in a world uh, also very important aspect is, is privacy. You want to be able to present, uh, to keep the uh, information of a user and be able to still maybe train the system, but while keeping privacy information. So I wanna give just a little glimpse about some of these uh, work in this real world. And one specific one is about robustness because a lot of time you get data and there's missing data, even in the lab setting, like sometimes the microphone didn't work or you have a word or there's an occlusion. And this work is uh, was led by Amir Zadeh, a PhD student who recently graduated and is also on the job market, I should mention, uh, and, and Santiago work on follow-up work with Amir, uh, and uh, he's going to be P applying for PhD. Um, so the typical approach when you have missing data, a typical way of learning will be this generative adversarial network. But we saw also that when missing data is there, they have a little bit of challenges. Another approach is this autoencoder. You take the data that you have. I have no clue what was said. Uh, somebody needs to un unmute, unmute, I think. Uh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so yeah. the idea of, and I will wrap up in a little bit. The idea here is to do encoder and decoder. So the idea, a typical way is to encode this information in such a way that I can represent it and then decode it. That's a classical way. But the challenge here is I can have many different inputs. 
And they should all go and be represented the same way because even if I have some of the language uh, off or some of the visual, they should all be uh, encoded the same way. And it's very hard for one encoder to encode all of these different variations into this one vector. So the cool idea here is to in fact, get rid of the encoder and just use a decoder. It is going to be a little bit more challenge when you optimize because now you suddenly need to optimize uh, even at test time the, the decoder and the learning the representation. But it's really nice because this decoder is going to be a lot more flexible. So given a new image, it's going to start with like some random location and it's going to move around until it finds some like best representation for the data that it can see. And so this is robustness, uh, and that's one of the challenge that is really important. I'm going to skip uh, two of them. Uh, I can invite you to look at the slide, but I just want to point this last one, which is I think I think is really important is privacy, because we learn all of these systems to detect. Uh, personality, mood, and all this. And these days, people are doing even from a, a cell phone. And so when you learn mood from a cell phone activity, you may think you're looking at mood, but it turned out that you're also learning identity of the person. That's often this, so here the colors mean different people. Uh, and so although you were learning mood, you end up learning a lot about people, and that was not the goal of it. And so what you can do to some uh, approach that's called selective additive learning is that you force it so that it's not good anymore at predicting identity and only good at predicting mood. And that's an example of privacy preserving. So yeah, I wanted to share with you the challenges in multimodal AI and also make you think a little bit more about the real world challenges. Merci beaucoup.